Welcome to the briefing on airplane performance. This briefing will discuss the relationship between TALPA and airplane performance. We'll focus on two types of airplanes of special interest to business aviation operators. Transport Category, Certificated to Part 25, Commuter Category, Certificated to Part 23. And we'll talk about TALPA's new recommendation to manufacturers on operational takeoff and landing distances when the runway is contaminated. Our discussion in this briefing will not involve a comprehensive review of airplane performance. If you're looking for an in-depth review, check out the FAA Transport Airplane Performance video series available on the FAA TV website or on NBAA's website. To go there, look for the link on the NBAA TALPA page. Most pilots are familiar with the basic runway requirements for takeoff. These requirements are the accelerate stop distance, the takeoff distance required to continue a takeoff following an engine failure, and the takeoff distance required with all engines operating. This last distance includes a safety margin of 15%. The airplane's takeoff weight must be limited such that each of the requirements can be met for any given takeoff. For twin-engine aircraft, the accelerate stop distance and the distance required to continue the takeoff after an engine failure are the most limiting. Where possible, the takeoff speed V1 is selected so that these two distances are equal. Following a series of rejected takeoff accidents, in 1998, the FAA published new rules that require manufacturers to furnish wet runway takeoff performance data. While this requirement was not made retroactive to earlier airplanes, the FAA allows manufacturers to provide this data to their airplanes that were not subject to these rules. These new rules provided airplane manufacturers with methods for determining the accelerate stop distance and the one engine inoperative takeoff distance on a wet runway that is assumed to be smooth. However, these new rules also allow manufacturers an option to provide additional wet runway data that takes advantage of skid resistant surfaces, such as runway grooving or porous coarse friction surfaces. Operators may use this data if they confirm with the airport that these surfaces are maintained in a manner acceptable to the FAA. When taking off on a wet runway, pilots must confirm that the runway length is adequate for takeoff based on the dry runway performance data, as well as the wet runway performance data. The takeoff performance requirements specific to commuter category airplanes are similar to those for transport category airplanes with two notable exceptions. Unlike certification rules for transport category airplanes, the commuter category rules base accelerate stop on an engine failure only and don't consider the possibility that the all engines operating accelerate stop distance may be longer. The second major difference is that there is no provision to provide wet runway accelerate stop distance data or takeoff distance data following an engine failure on a wet runway. The FAA certification rules don't address takeoff performance on runways that are contaminated with water, snow, ice, slush, or any other contaminants. Therefore, manufacturers are not required to furnish pilots with performance data intended for use on these contaminated surfaces. However, other states have established certification rules that do require takeoff performance data for use on contaminated runways. The FAA allows manufacturers to publish data based on these other state rules in the AFM. However, FAA considers this data to be advisory only and requires that it be separated from the approved performance data published in the AFM. For transport category airplanes, the FAA offers manufacturers several different options for use when determining the airplane's landing distance. The option used most often results in landing distances that are not representative of everyday operational practices. Therefore, these distances, which are published in the AFM, are shorter than the landing distances achieved in normal line operations. Let's look at some of the reasons why this may be so. Earlier demonstration methods used during the flight test of transport category airplanes involved testing at touchdown rates up to a limit of 10 feet per second or 600 feet per minute. 
After an accident in 1980 that happened during actual testing, along with heightened industry concern over these certification practices, FAA changed the rules for the certification of these airplanes and furnished new guidance determining the actual landing distance for certification purposes. To address concerns with the use of high touchdown rates during flight testing, the FAA adopted a method that mathematically models the air distance from 50 feet above the runway to the touchdown point. This parametric analysis method extrapolates flight test data obtained during landings using approach angles between 2.5 and 3.5 degrees and touchdown rates between 2 feet per second and 6 feet per second. Collecting this data allows modeling of the air distance using an approach angle of 3.5 degrees followed by touchdown at a sink rate of 8 feet per second, which is 480 feet per minute. The air distance achieved using the parametric analysis method closely matches the air distance achieved during the flight testing that involved actual touchdown sink rates as high as 10 feet per second. These air distances are shorter than the average pilot is likely to achieve during normal operations. Parametric analysis method is used for certification of actual landing distances in many transport category airplanes. A clue this method was used can be gleaned through certain statements published in the Airplane Flight Manual concerning glide slope or glide path angles and touchdown rates. The parametric analysis method is not the only method that can be used to determine the actual landing distance in transport category airplanes. These methods include an FAA-approved analysis using the upper bounds of zero-wind air distances achieved during past certifications. Another method allows for the actual measurement of airborne distances during flight testing. When the manufacturer elects to measure the airborne distance through a series of landings within the landing weight range, the glide slope angle of all landings cannot exceed 3 degrees, and the target rate of descent at touchdown should not exceed 6 feet per second. It's important pilots understand that actual landing distance data found in the AFM may be based on assumptions that don't necessarily reflect the operating environment during typical day-to-day -day line operations. While the certification rules require accountability for the airport elevation or pressure altitude and a conservative accounting of the headwind or tailwind component, they also assume a standard day temperature, that the airplane arrives 50 feet above the runway at the published VREF speed, it assumes that the runway has zero slope and that the pilot applies maximum manual wheel braking to a full stop. During normal operations, the approach speed at the runway threshold may be higher than the VREF speed assumed at 50 feet. Pilots generally touch down at rates far less than those assumed by the parametric analysis method. Pilots generally do not apply the brakes immediately upon touchdown and then use maximum manual braking to a complete stop. If correction factors for non-standard temperatures and runway slope are not furnished by the manufacturer, then warmer than standard temperatures and downsloping runways can also increase the stopping distance required after touchdown. For these reasons, the landing distances typically achieved out of normal landings are often longer than the distances published in the airplane flight manual. The table shown here compares the differences between the certification criteria and variables often encountered during line operations. It illustrates the effect of these variables on the landing distances often published in the AFM. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like to review this table. Publishing landing distances in the AFM that can't be achieved during normal operations might seem contradictory at first. However, this is allowed with the full awareness that the rules for Part 121 operators, who primarily use transport category airplanes, require adding in additional factors that establish the minimum operational field length for landing at both the destination airport and at the alternate airport. These additional factors also apply to Part 135 and Part 91K operators also using transport category and commuter category airplanes. However, these operators may be permitted to reduce these factors with additional operating requirements and pilot training.
The rules for flights conducted under Part 121, Part 135, and Part 91K ensure that the airplanes arrive at a landing weight at which they can stop within 60% of the runway length available for landing. The landing distances used for this determination are based on the dry runway landing distance determined during certification. This leaves as much as 40% of the runway still available for variables that might affect the landing distance but were not considered during certification or to help account for unforeseen changes occurring while en route, changes that could affect the ability of the flight to safely land on arrival. The length of runway needed to meet this requirement is often referred to as the factored landing distance. This is a pre-flight planning requirement that imposes a limitation on the takeoff weight of the airplane in consideration of the fuel used en route to the destination airport and to the alternate airport if one is required. Also, if the destination airport's runway is forecast to be wet or slippery at the planned time of arrival, then the factored landing distance must be increased by an additional 15%. As we stated earlier, with additional operating requirements and pilot training, Part 135 and Part 91K operators may be permitted to arrive at a landing weight with which the airplane can stop with an 80% of the runway length available for landing. This leaves only 20% of the runway available for other variables that might affect the actual distance achieved during the landing maneuver. The rules used to determine landing distance in a Part 23 airplane are like those used in a transport category airplane, with two notable exceptions. The first is that the effects of runway slope must be determined, and these effects must be addressed in the landing distance data furnished in the airplane flight manual. Second, the Part 23 rules assume a smooth flare to touchdown resulting from normal piloting techniques. The parametric analysis method, which we discussed earlier and is used to determine landing distance in a transport category airplane, is not allowed to be used in Part 23 airplanes. This is because the operating rules for these airplanes typically do not impose additional runway requirements at the destination and alternate airports as conditions of flight dispatch. The one exception, when a Part 23 commuter category airplane is operated in on-demand service under Part 135, for these operations, some airplane manufacturers do offer landing distance data based on the parametric analysis method through a supplemental type certificate intended for use when these airplanes are operated under Part 135. These assumptions apply equally to all Part 23 airplanes, including piston power single and multi-engine airplanes and those with turboprops. Turboprop airplanes may take credit for the effect of propeller disc braking that occurs when the power levels are moved into the ground idle position. The AFM landing distance data will reflect this stopping performance credit. The conditions faced by pilots during day-to-day -day operations seldom match the ideal conditions assumed by the certification rules used to determine takeoff and landing performance. While the additional landing runway requirements provided by the air carrier and commercial operating rules address some of these variables, they don't address all possible factors that could adversely impact landing performance, especially when the runway is contaminated. While the additional runway length for landing provided by the operating rules helps reduce the risk of an overrun when the runway is dry or when a wet runway has a skid-resistant surface, accident statistics on runway excursions clearly indicate that this extra runway is not always sufficient to prevent an overrun when the runway is contaminated by water, snow, ice, or slush. In response to the growing threat of excursion accidents occurring on contaminated runways, the FAA conducted an internal review of the adequacy of existing regulations and guidance regarding takeoff and landing performance on these runways. The FAA identified areas for improvement in the regulations, guidance, and industry practices for developing performance data on contaminated runways and for conducting landing performance assessments at the time of arrival. These recommendations are furnished to the airplane manufacturers in two new advisory circulars. These documents provide voluntary guidance that manufacturers can use to develop performance data on contaminated runways. While primarily intended for manufacturers, these ACs provide insight into transport category airplane performance on contaminated runways that pilots and operators might find useful. Much of the information furnished in this briefing was obtained from these advisory circulars.
These advisory circulars are also available on NBAA's TELPA page. Performance data for takeoff from a contaminated runway is determined by calculations as opposed to actual flight testing. Except for accounting for the effects of a particular contaminant on braking friction and drag, contaminated runway takeoff data may be based on the same models developed and assumptions used to show compliance with the performance requirements for a takeoff from a wet runway, as defined in the certification rules. FAA's new advisory guidance furnishes wheel braking coefficients for several types of runway contaminant. These coefficients are consistent with the runway condition descriptions found in FAA's Runway Condition Assessment Matrix. It allows manufacturers to produce performance data that matches the runway field condition reports received by pilots during their pre-flight briefings or furnished by air traffic controllers. The new guidance also provides a conservative accounting for the additional drag that results from contaminants being displaced by the airplane's tires and the impingement of contaminant spray on the airframe. This additional drag provides a force impeding acceleration during a normal takeoff or during a takeoff where the engine fails after V1. Conversely, this additional drag helps deceleration during a rejected takeoff. To help pilots assess landing distance requirements at the time of arrival, FAA's new guidance on landing performance data furnishes wheel braking coefficients that themselves correspond to the new runway condition codes and pilot braking action definitions. Landing distance data can be developed based on the reported runway condition code or the pilot braking action level, allowing pilots to evaluate the landing distance required under the reported conditions against the length of the runway that's available for landing. The FAA is asking pilots to perform a landing distance assessment prior to landing on a contaminated runway. Any performance data used by the pilot to make this assessment must be based on the same procedures that they'll use and consider any variables likely to be encountered during the landing. In their new advisory circular, the FAA is furnishing airplane manufacturers with guidance on how to determine a reasonable air distance based on typical flare techniques and touchdown rates used by pilots. The FAA also recommends that operational landing distance data consider normal speed additives used to counter the effects of wind gusts, along with any increases to landing distance caused by using ice protection systems. This data should also contain corrections for wind, temperature, and runway slope. While not specifically required, the FAA recommends that the operational landing distance data include at least a 15% safety margin, which helps the pilot evaluate whether the runway is long enough for the reported runway condition code. Manufacturers or operators can increase this margin if they desire. FAA's focus with this new guidance is to furnish pilots with operational landing distance data that aligns with the runway condition codes and pilot braking action reports so they have a complete set of tools necessary to perform a time of arrival landing distance assessment. Pilots can use this landing distance data to determine whether the runway length is adequate for the current runway conditions. If they're approaching the airport and the weather and runway conditions are deteriorating, the data might be used to determine the lowest reported runway condition code or braking action level acceptable for landing on a particular runway. This is an important part of FAA's TALPA initiative to help pilots making safer decisions when landing in less than ideal conditions. But FAA's guidance is new. So new, in fact, that a lot of manufacturers have yet to provide their customers with this new data. A lot of manufacturers already furnish advisory data for use with wet and contaminated runways. This information is not FAA approved, but is often based on the requirements imposed by other state regulators. For example, the European Aviation Safety Agency. It's often based on the landing distance data published in the AFM with adjustments applied to reflect the coefficient of braking for a contaminant type. Since the data is based on the landing distances published in the AFM, it may not account for variables such as approach speeds greater than VREF or the typical air distances resulting from a normal landing flare. Normally, this data does not include a safety margin. If this data was not created using FAA's TALPA-based advisory circulars, operators should consider contacting the manufacturer 
for guidance on how to use it with the new runway condition codes and braking action reports. The FAA recognizes many older airplanes are no longer supported by their manufacturers. Since FAA's new guidance is also voluntary, not all manufacturers may offer landing performance data based on FAA's latest TALPA guidance. For those airplanes without TALPA-based performance data, the FAA is providing a landing distance factors table for use in determining an operational landing distance based on the runway's condition code or reported braking action. These are applied to the dry runway unfactored landing distances published in the airplane flight manual. The result is an operational landing distance for the reported runway conditions or braking action that can be used as part of a time of arrival landing distance assessment. These factors include the recommended 15% safety margin with additional allowances for variables identified in FAA's Landing Performance Data Advisory Circular. Separate factors are provided for turbojet airplanes with and without thrust reversers, for reciprocating engine airplanes, and for turboprop airplanes where the AFM provides a landing distance credit for the use of ground idle reverse. Turboprop airplanes without this credit should use the turbojet no reverse landing distance factor. This table is now available in a new Safety Advisory for Operators Bulletin recently released by FAA concerning time of arrival landing distance assessment. This SAFO replaces an earlier one released following the Chicago Midway runway excursion back in 2005. We'll discuss how pilots use these factors during our TALPA application briefing. As we discussed earlier, airplanes operated under Part 121 have minimum runway requirements at the destination and at the alternate airport. These requirements are assessed at the time of the flight's dispatch and limit the airplane's takeoff weight. The TALPA Rulemaking Committee and the FAA both agree that these dispatch requirements are adequate for basing a time of arrival landing distance assessment when the runway is dry, provided the assumptions used at the time of dispatch remain valid at the actual time of arrival. This allows flight crews to base their assessment on the landing runway analysis data provided with their dispatch release. Part 135 and Part 91K operators may also use the dispatch rules for this assessment, provided dispatch was based on the same criteria used for Part 121. In other words, dispatch landing runway length must have been based on coming to stop within 60% of the runway's available landing distance. These dispatch requirements may also be used for a time of arrival landing assessment when landing on a wet runway that is either a grooved or PFC surface, provided the runway conditions are the same or better than assumed at dispatch. However, dispatch must be based on coming to a stop within 60% of the runway's available landing distance, plus the additional 15% for the wet or slippery runway. Grooved and PFC runway surfaces help remove standing water from the runway and from the area between the runway's surface and the airplane's tires during braking. This improves the stopping performance and helps prevent hydroplaning. However, braking performance on these wet runways never reaches the performance found on a dry runway. Therefore, even a wet runway with a grooved or PFC surface should never be considered as dry when computing airplane performance. FAA is providing the landing distance factors for wet runways with grooved and PFC surfaces. These factors can be used to determine an operational landing distance for a time of arrival assessment when this type of runway surface is wet. The improved stopping performance on these runways is also dependent on the pilot using every available stopping device, including thrust reversers on jet airplanes and ground idle on turboprop airplanes. If your airplane is not equipped with these stopping devices, or you fly a reciprocating engine airplane, the FAA provides increased landing distance factors when these runways are wet. Many runways do not have grooved or PFC surfaces. These runways are often referred to as being smooth. A smooth runway cannot remove water as effectively as one that has a grooved or PFC surface. This reduces braking performance and increases the risk of hydroplaning during landing. Therefore, additional stopping distance will be required. The airplane's stopping performance will also rely more heavily on other stopping devices like airplane's thrust reversers. If these devices are not used, then the landing distance required increases even more.
When landing on a wet runway without a grooved or PFC surface, the performance data used for the time of arrival landing distance assessment must account for the reduced stopping performance. The FAA's new TALPA guidance for landing data uses the same wet runway braking performance methods used to determine the wet runway accelerate stop distance in transport category airplanes. These methods also assume that the wet runway has a smooth surface without the benefit of grooving or a PFC overlay. For airplanes without TALPA-based landing distance data, FAA's new landing distance factors table has factors that pilots can use when landing on a smooth runway that's wet. Looking at this table, you can easily see the importance of using all available stopping devices when landing on a smooth runway that's wet. Even a runway with a grooved or PFC surface is susceptible to increased slipperiness during heavy rain. Landing overruns that occur on wet runways typically involve multiple contributing factors, such as long touchdown, improper use of deceleration devices, tailwind. However, several recent incidents have raised concerns with wet runway stopping performance assumptions. These overruns have occurred on grooved, PFC, and smooth runways during periods of moderate to heavy rain. Analysis of these incidents indicates the braking coefficient of friction in each case was significantly lower than expected, and that 30 to 40 percent of additional stopping distance may have been required for the conditions present at landing. Since these same braking coefficients are also used by the TALPA wet runway landing data for a runway code of 5, these distances could also prove inadequate in certain wet runway conditions. The 1 8 inch threshold that distinguishes a wet runway with a code of 5 from a runway contaminated with water that's assigned a code of 2 is based on the possibility of dynamic hydroplaning. This can be especially true in moderate rain if the runway is not properly crowned, grooved, or constructed with a porous friction course overlay. In heavy rain, this may be true even on a properly maintained grooved or PFC runway. In 2015, FAA alerted operators to this situation in Safety Alert for Operators Bulletin 15009 concerning turbojet braking performance on wet runways. The SAFO recommends including additional conservatism to the time of arrival assessment when landing during periods of active, moderate, or heavy rain. This SAFO was published prior to the release of FAA's latest TALPA guidance. The current TALPA RCAM recommends using landing performance data associated with medium to poor braking or runway condition code 2 when weather reports, your flight visibility, or onboard weather radar suggest heavy rain is occurring on a runway with a grooved or PFC surface. If the runway is smooth, assume medium to poor braking with indications of moderate or greater rainfall. A go-around may be warranted on final if rainfall intensity changes for the worse. In some cases, holding for a short period until that rainfall has decreased may be a prudent option. For more information, please check out the link to FAA's SAFO 15009 Bulletin on the NBAA TALPA website. As we come to a close, let's review some key points. The takeoff and landing performance data found in your AFM is based on the FAA's certification rules. However, these rules often assume conditions that differ from what pilots frequently encounter during their day-to-day -day flying. This performance data may not account for all runway conditions you might encounter during your flying, and it may not reflect how you fly your airplane during the approach and landing. If you fly under Part 121, 135, or 91K, your operating rules will require that your landing weight on arrival at the destination airport and at the alternate airport, if one is required, allow you to come to a stop within a set percentage of the runway's length available for landing. This requirement compensates for some of the variables not addressed by the certification rules, but it's also proven inadequate when landing on a contaminated runway. To address these shortcomings, the FAA has published new guidance for developing takeoff data based on the contaminants described in the new Runway Condition Assessment Matrix.
FAA has also published new guidance for developing landing data based on the new runway condition codes and the pilot braking action definitions. This data will help pilots make a time of arrival landing performance assessment based on the reported conditions. This new data also considers many of the variables not accounted for in the certification rules. For landing, this means the performance data is more representative of actual operations. The goal is to provide better performance data to pilots, data that can directly correlate to the field condition notams, runway condition codes, and pilot braking action reports. With this new data in hand, and with FAA's new field condition reporting requirements, pilots will be able to make safer decisions when operating on runways that are either wet or contaminated. The FAA hopes this will reduce the risk of runway excursions under these conditions. And this concludes your briefing on airplane performance.